In chapter 4, verse 15, Matthew tells us that Jesus moved to Capernaum in Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles. The question is, was the Galilean region populated by Gentiles? If not, did Matthew get it wrong? And why does he cite Isaiah when he decides to describe Galilee in this way? Let's dive in. The first two chapters of Matthew's Gospel serves as an introduction to his Gospel. So what does he think is so important for us to understand before he jumps into Jesus' ministry in chapter 3? First, he tells us about Jesus' lineage, which is very interesting. Jesus descended from David, but he also had four women who were Gentiles in his background and with big questions about their sexuality over them. And I should note that you can go back and watch the videos I've done on these topics before if you like. And I'll have all of the different videos listed in this video underneath in the show more section. Second, the whole dilemma about Mary being pregnant before she was married to Joseph, which would have been a huge issue then, Matthew resolves in two ways. On Joseph's side, he tells us about Joseph having a visitation from an angel that explains the whole situation to him. On the other hand, Matthew lets us as readers know that this was to fulfill what God said to Isaiah. Matthew 1.23 Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Third, Matthew recounts for us the story of the Magi who come from the east to worship the newborn king, Gentiles. When Herod learns about this, he starts planning on how he can protect his position as a king. The wise men are then warned not to return to Herod, and Joseph is warned likewise to take his family and flee to Egypt because of Herod. The fourth event takes place in Matthew 2.16. When Herod learns that he has been deceived, he then has all the baby boys under the age of two killed in Bethlehem. And then finally, after Herod has died, Joseph obeys an angelic vision once again and returns to Israel. If you're new to the channel, welcome to the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and other institutions around the world for the past 20 to 30 years and make it available to anyone here on YouTube. And if you like these videos, do me a favor, and it's going to cost you nothing at all. Subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and hit the share button and let other people know about these videos. Okay, back to our topic. We enter into the main body of Matthew's Gospel in chapter 3. Jesus is now an adult and he presents himself to John the Baptist to be baptized. This serves as an introduction to Jesus and the opening of his ministry, especially with the voice from heaven that declares, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, in 3.17. Matthew then jumps from such a positive scene, filled with prophets, water, voices from heaven, to the wilderness, where there's no food and a dialogue with the devil. Quite a dramatic turnaround. But don't worry, our hero passes the three temptations by the tempter and once again proves that he is trustworthy for the ministry that he is about to embark upon. This is quite a dramatic opening to Matthew's Gospel, but that's not what we're looking at today. It just sets the stage for what we're getting to in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Matthew 4.17, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version today, reads, Now when he had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, the way by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From a narrative point of view, this section in Matthew chapter 4 serves two important functions. First, it serves as a geographical transition from Jesus being born, Bethlehem, into Egypt, Nazareth, to his setting up shop in Capernaum, where he's going to spend close to the next three years of his life ministering. 
Second, it shifts us from all these stories about Jesus' birth, flight into Egypt, baptism, and temptation to his actively launching his ministry. 417 tells us, from that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verses 12 and 13 are pretty straightforward. Once he learns that John the Baptist has been arrested, he relocates from Nazareth down to Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. What gets interesting, though, is how Matthew describes Capernaum as in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali. This is how that region would have been described prior to the Assyrian invasion in 722 BC. And during Jesus' day, it would have been known as Galilee, or part of Herod the Great's son Antiochus' territory. Matthew has a very antiquarian way of referring to things. It's one of his traits. For example, in 1522, he tells us about the Canaanite woman from that region that comes and begs Jesus to heal her daughter. Now, the Canaanites have been displaced for hundreds of years. The region now is part of Syrophoenicia. In the parallel account in Mark's Gospel, Mark uses language that would have been common during the day of Jesus. He calls her a Syrophoenician woman. In the following verses in Matthew chapter 4, things get even more interesting. He cites Isaiah 9.1, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. In particular, he calls Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles. And as I asked in the introduction, was Galilee Gentile territory? And if it wasn't, does Matthew get this wrong? There's more going on here than meets the eye. So let's dive into the historical background behind this passage. In order to understand this, we need to do a quick tour through history. Our first stop in our historical tour is 1,000 years or so before this, when Israel is in the middle of its conquest for the Promised Land. The region of Galilee was settled by the tribes of Asher, Issachar, Naphtali, and Zebulon. They occupied this region from around 1000 BC, or the Kingdom of Saul, down to around 722 BC, when the mighty kingdom of Assyria invaded the land, about two to 300 years in total. Around 750 BC, Assyria rose to become the superpower in the north, in what is now modern-day northern Iraq. Like most superpowers, they went on an expansion spree. In 722 BC, Tiglath-Pileser III conquered all of the northern ten tribes of Israel, including the region of Galilee. The people living in that region were taken off as captives into Assyria, most of whom never returned to the land. We even have in various museums around the world ancient Assyrian texts in which Tiglath-Pileser listed the cities of Galilee that he conquered. He then made Galilee into an Assyrian province. The reason why this is important is when Isaiah wrote, Galilee was Gentile territory. The Assyrians had conquered it, taken the people of Israel away, and resettled it with their own people that were loyal to the empire. So his message was one of hope to these captives that had been taken off. They were dwelling in darkness now, in the region and the shadow of death, slaves in a foreign land. And he pictures their hope as life breaking into that darkness and hopelessness. We don't hear much about Galilee in various documents until around 160 BC. In 168 BC, Antiochus Epiphany was the king of a new superpower in the north, the Seleucid Empire. And he's rather tired of the people of Israel not following the customs of his empire. They're not going along with his program. So in 168 BC, he has the high priest in Jerusalem replaced with his own personal man who then sacrifices a pig on the altar. This is the spark that sets off the Maccabean revolt against the Seleucid Empire. It's a long and very protracted guerrilla warfare that Israel eventually wins, and they get their freedom from the Seleucid Empire. Their initial victories were in the south, around Jerusalem, but they slowly expand northward and are able to retake the region of Galilee. In 1 Maccabees 5.21, we have a record of the brutality of this period. 
Simon, the Maccabean king at this time, took an army of 3,000 men and invaded Galilee. His campaign was probably to protect Jewish settlers there, but he was very successful. And Maccabees tells us that he slaughtered the people of that land there, took their valuables as spoils, and their wives and children as slaves into Judea. Israel's independence was short-lived though. In 63 BC, the Romans were invited to come into the land to put down a civil war between competing claims to the throne in Jerusalem. This brought an end to the independent Jewish kingdom and began the period of Roman occupation and rule over Palestine. So what was Galilee like during Jesus' day? The first thing we need to keep in mind is the Maccabean conquest of the region of Galilee and the brutality of that. The second thing is, is that there's a lot of evidence for Gentile occupation in the region of Galilee. The problem with it though is that all of that archaeological evidence comes from the 2nd and 3rd century AD forward, not during the time of Christ. Instead, during the 1st century, Galilee was pretty thoroughly Jewish, and there's a lot of evidence for this. First, when Herod the Great was given the throne to rule Israel by Rome, he put down a revolt in the region of Galilee, and he consolidated Galilee into the region of Israel once again, like the Maccabees did. When Herod the Great died, his son Antiochus then inherited this region for his rule, and he continued the Jewish rule of that area. At the same time, Israel was a very small nation surrounded by much larger nations and cultures. In order to keep their Roman connections happy, Herod the Great built Caesarea Maritime, the port city down on the Mediterranean Sea. He not only named the city after Caesar, but he also built it along the lines of a Roman city. About four miles from Nazareth, he built a city called Sepphoris, and down the city of Galilee, he built Tiberias. These cities had Greco-Roman architecture and layout, and even some temples to Augustus and Roma, the god of the city of Rome. But these cities were not thoroughly Gentile at the same time. They lacked amphitheaters, gymnasiums, and stadiums. However, life in the small towns and villages of Galilee was quite different. First off, there is very little of any evidence of Greco-Roman architecture or layout in these villages. Second, the coins that we have found from this period of time tell a great deal as well. Here are some sample coins from the first century. Now notice, they don't have depictions of people or animals like most Roman coins. Rather, they have plant descriptions, which was acceptable to the Jewish sensibilities of that time. The lettering on these coins is Latin, so it shows how Antiochus, who minted these coins, is walking a tightrope. The Latin shows his connection with the larger Greco-Roman empire and culture, but the depiction of the plants shows how he is sensitive to the Jewish religion. Third, there are no ruins of pagan temples within the region of Galilee that have been found. Not only that, but there are no inscriptions that have been carved like in walls or stones or anything like that to various pagan gods. But once you leave the region of Galilee, then you find temples and inscriptions to other deities in this area that surrounds Galilee. Fourth, during Jesus' day, communities there used jars and vessels carved out of stone, not made out of clay, for what they wanted to keep ritually clean. The story of Jesus turning water into wine in John chapter 2 is an example of this, and these stone vessels have been found throughout the region of Galilee during that archaeological period. Fifth, mikvah. These were small pools of water with steps that led down into them, and they were used by the Jewish communities for ceremonial cleansing. In the archaeological remains from Jesus' day in these small towns and villages around Galilee, they found numerous of these mikvah in those communities. Another piece of evidence that points to the Jewishness of the region of Galilee during Jesus' day is what we know about their Jewish burial practices and the evidence from it. They would have two burials. The first one is they would take the body and cleanse it and place it within a tomb. Then a year later, they would have a second burial. They would go into the tombs, collect the decomposed remains, and place it in a small wooden clay or stone box, which is called an ossuary. There was a big sensation about 20 years ago when an ossuary was found with the inscription of James, the brother of Jesus. 
This was never definitively proven to be from the time of Christ. The key thing is, is that these ossuaries that we found are pretty strong evidence of the Jewishness of the region of Galilee during Jesus' day. The archaeologist Mark Chancey sums up all of this evidence this way. The conclusion is clear. During the early first century, when Jesus lived in Galilee, he was hardly infused with Greco-Roman influence. Instead, we should look at it as a region with a cultural climate in flux. It was not totally isolated from the architectural, artistic, and linguistic trends of the larger Greco-Roman world, but neither had it fully incorporated them into its own culture. Galilee was predominantly Jewish during Jesus' lifetime. Most of the areas around it, however, were predominantly Gentile. Galilee was largely a Jewish enclave. So why then does Matthew cite Isaiah 9-1, especially its reference to Galilee of the Gentiles? When Matthew cites from prophecies like this, it raises questions. From our perspective, it looks like Isaiah in particular is talking about one thing, and Matthew uses it for a different reason. Matthew often plays off ideas, concepts, or words within the text and sees them as divinely foreordained references to Jesus. We tend to read the text more historically and grammatically today and don't read these ancient texts the same way. Matthew does not use this quotation to introduce the idea that Jesus is ministering in a Gentile situation in Galilee. In fact, it's the exception when we see Jesus interacting with Gentiles in his gospel. I think the reason why Matthew cites Isaiah 9-1 is because it fits within his larger theological agenda. In Jesus' genealogy, Matthew introduced four women who were part of Jesus' lineage, all of Gentile descent. Then in chapter 2, we meet the Magi who come and worship Jesus, Gentiles. And then finally, at the very end of his gospel in Matthew 28, Jesus commands his church to go and make disciples of all the nations, literally all the Gentiles. So Isaiah's reference to Galilee of the Gentiles fits Matthew's theology. He wants us to see the theological importance of Jesus' ministry, that it's not just for one group of people, but it's for everyone, the Gentiles. He also wants us to see the opening of Jesus' ministry in a very dramatic manner. A great light is shining into the darkness. Hope, liberation, forgiveness, restoration, and truth are dawning with the opening of Jesus' ministry. This is a message that still resonates with us today. Thanks for joining me today. Hope you stick around and catch the next video on Matthew. Till then, you know what to do. Subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and share the video. Let others know about these. Until then, peace.